Good morning. Are there any announcements for this morning? Thank you, BJ. Yes. Let us stand for the call to worship. <clears throat> Open wide the doorways of our sanctuary. May the King of Glory come to our midst. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord is strong and mighty. Open the doorways of our hearts to receive Jesus Christ. May the Son of God come into our hearts. Who is this Son of God? This is the Lord of us. He is the King of glory. Our opening to him today is Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Let us together ask God for forgiveness. O oh Lord, so many things claim our attention. We work hard during the week to earn a little rest and recreation, to break away from all the stresses of our everyday living. But we have too often pushed our worship of you aside. We have focused so much on our own physical and emotional needs that we have often neglected our spiritual hungers and thirst. Forgive us when we are tempted to stray from our worship of you and focus entirely on ourselves and our own needs. As we celebrate this day, help us remember all the wondrous things you continue to do for us. Let us look at the world as a place of delight given to us by you. And when we encounter situations in which sorrow and hurt abound, help us to be ready to bring hope and peace. Be with us in these warm days of summer, preparing for mission and ministry in your holy name. Amen. God is merciful and just, pouring out God's love upon us abundantly. Several of them are from me.
Yes. On what? Yes. Um, from what I heard, I, I actually went last week to go see him, and he was not at Jefferson, but had been transferred to Allegheny General. Um, and they are working on a leaky valve in his heart, and it may have caused the, the fall in some way. But he is supposed to be transferred to West End. So we'll keep him in our prayers as well. Yes. Um, Bob's sister, or Bob's brother's wife, Kim, yes. um, was just diagnosed with, um, I don't, with some with a, with a medical issue that needs to be dealt with. Any others? Then let us pray. Lord of the dance of life, you have breathed into us your creative, joyful spirit. You have lifted us from the dust into the swirling joy of your presence. We are so grateful for all that you've done for us. And each day reminds us in many ways of your mercy and your love. Yet there are times in our lives when we have felt lost. been hurt and frightened and wondered where you were. So Lord, remind us again of your loving presence. Place your hands of healing on our lives. Comfort us when we become afraid or lost, lonely or fearful. Lord, prepare us to serve you faithfully all of our days. And this day as we prepare our hearts for prayer, we have lifted the names of dear ones to you who are in need of your loving care. We especially <clears throat> pray for Kim, for Joanne, for David, for Ron. We lift them all in your embrace. Gracious God, allow us also to reflect on our own needs for your love and our response in dedicated service to you. So be with us now in this time of silence. Lord, surround our lives with your joy and grace. As we now lift our voices up to you, praying together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join together in singing Alleluia, Sing to Jesus.
is Psalm number 24. The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world, and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And now turning to our New Testament scripture reading, it is from the letter to the church in Ephesus, chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will. So that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption of, as God's own people, to the praise of of his glory. Thanks be to God for the reading of God's holy word. So this section of Ephesians is really unlike any other portion of Paul's writing. It's a different kind of letter than he normally writes, because in it, Paul is not debating or answering ugly charges that were thrown or hurled against him. He's not trying to rebuke anyone to get them to see the error of their ways, or even necessarily trying to be the ultimate evangelist, as he so often does in his writing. But he does in this section use a lot of really churchy type words that we think we automatically understand, but do we fully grasp the breadth of their meaning that some of these words hold? So I'd like for us to spend a little bit of time reviewing some of those words and how together they create a divine understanding that Paul is talking about in this letter to the people of Ephesus. As you probably already know, I'm not a huge Paul fan. Because many times our Christianity has become more Pauline 
than it is Christian. Because Paul can be very opinionated. He's outspoken. He is dogmatic to a fault. And he is quite judgmental. But here, Paul simply lays out a very joyful phrase about God and God's plan. Because that plan is now not just about a small faction of people that once were led out of the wilderness into the promised land. This plan is now to envelop the whole planet. It's not about what separates us, but instead it's about what unites us. So the first word that I want us to explore is a word that Paul uses when he says that we are chosen. By God. Is there anything quite like the feeling that comes when we are chosen? I remember what it was like growing up being a small kid and not very athletic in the same way that all the other kids were. The kids I grew up with were into football and soccer and baseball and basketball. Well, the only athletic things that I tended to excel in were those more individual sports, like swimming or gymnastics. In gym class, there were always the regulars who became captain of the team and got to pick their teammates. And it always came down to me and my friend Jim at the end. I was the short, stocky kid and Jim was that tall, wanky, skinny kid. Invariably, they would pick Jim first. And the games were always some kind of team sport in which I didn't know the rules, couldn't outrun any of the other players, or couldn't reach things quite like other players could, and didn't have quite enough bulk necessarily to just stand there and be an opponent. It wasn't until about 8th grade, and we were given some instructions on the gymnastic equipment at school for the first time. Most of the kids had never seen the parallel bars or the rings or a pummel horse, and our first lesson was on the horse. All we were supposed to do was to come up to the horse, hit the board, and try to jump over it. The gym teacher would be there to place our hands properly on the top of the horse and help us over. As usual, I was at the end with my friend Jim. Most of the kids in my gym class didn't have the right approach to the board, or they tripped, or they stopped too short, or they bounced too much, and they, or they didn't get enough bounce, and they barely made it over. Now, as I mentioned, there weren't a lot of things in gym class that I was good at. But gymnastics stuff, I knew how to do. I began running at full speed up to the board when suddenly the gym teacher stepped in front of the horse and said loudly, whoa, whoa, what do you think you're doing? And behind me, I heard all the kids snicker or start to giggle. I continued to walk then up to the horse and in front of the gym teacher and he leaned down and said, what do you think you're doing? I just want you to walk up to this board, jump on it, and I'll help you over. Well, I quietly told him that I knew what I was doing. He said, well, I just want you to jump over, and that's it for now. So I went back and did what I was supposed to do, listening to all the comments the kids were making behind my breath, or under their breath. However, on the second pass, when we got a chance to go again, I went at full speed and jumped over the horse without any assistance. Now, I didn't stick the landing as competitors are supposed to do, but I did a pretty decent job. And the room was dead quiet. During the rest of that semester, our gym teacher, for the first time ever, had me demonstrate how a particular piece of gym equipment was used. The parallel bars, the rings. It just happened to be something that I was naturally good at. And for the first time in gym class, 
I got to summer. After four weeks, we were back to our team sports, and this time it was floor hockey. Yay. <laughs> Normally, I would have either found an excuse to miss gym class altogether, or would have waited to be picked last, as usual. This time, however, I was picked second. Now, I still wasn't any good at these team sport things, with, with games that I didn't much like, or felt good at. But for the first time, to be picked second, to be chosen, felt great. And I made a better effort. I tried harder. I wanted the team to know that they didn't choose me in error. Before, I didn't really care very much. They didn't care to choose me, so why should I care to try and do very much? It felt great to know that I was chosen, instead of being just what was left. God chooses you. Paul never thought of himself as having chosen God, but quite the contrary. God chose him. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples. You have not chosen me, but I choose you. Thomas Merton once asked, what am I? And then he answered his own question by saying, I am myself a word spoken by God. How we perceive ourselves, who we think ourselves to be, determines the very direction of our lives, and it shapes all of our relationships. To accept at the depth of our being that we are chosen by God is the antidote for our insecurity, our neurotic fears, our striving to be accepted, our self-depreciation. But God doesn't just choose us. God chooses us for a purpose. How many of you are familiar with Herman Melville's book, Moby Dick? Yeah. It's a classic, and there's a gripping scene where Captain Ahab tightens a carpenter's vice on his hand. And with grimacing sternness, he tightens it tighter and tighter and says to the sky and the sea, a man has to feel something that holds in this slippery world. We need something to hold in a slippery world. And ours is that kind of a world. Our cultural, if it feels good, do it, doesn't provide very much direction in life. But God's choosing us for a purpose, does. So two more words that are common but maybe we don't fully grasp its understanding. Or that God chooses us to be holy and blameless. We are to be distinctly different, set apart by God for God's purposes. We don't always understand this completely. Sometimes people have interpreted this to mean that we need to separate ourselves from the world. We need to send our kids to a private Christian school. We need to work in an all-Christian environment. We need to surround ourselves day <clears throat> or only with Christian friends. We need to work with just Christians. But that is not what holy set apart means. It doesn't mean separated from the world, but rather different from the world. Distinct, but within the world's chaos. A difference expressed in the world. Not only has God chosen us for the purpose of being holy, but here's the second word in that, in that phrase together. We're also supposed to be blameless. Now the Greek word for blameless, blameless is amamos. And it's a sacrificial word. It means to be unblemished. Our whole lives are to be an offering to God. When we have done things that we know we're not supposed to be doing, I've heard so many people say, well, I'm only human. But what does that 
really even mean? That being human sort of damns us to being something that is weak? Incomplete, broken, unable to make choices, driven only by animal instincts, incapable of morality? I think that's a cop-out. We were created in the image of God, holy and blameless, unblemished. We are more than capable, more than strong enough, more than broken or incomplete. We are whole human beings, capable of living up to God's expectations of us. Granted, I know none of us are perfect. All of us fall short of God's glory. But God chose us for a purpose, to live a holy and blameless life, offering that life as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice for a purpose. Now, if you remember Sunday school class many, many, many years ago, you probably learned the catechisms. And one of the catechisms asks, what is the chief end of man? Or in other words, what is our ultimate purpose in life? And the answer to that question is to praise God and enjoy God forever. That is the highest function of our life that God has blessed. So being chosen by God for a purpose is that first affirmation that Paul gives us in this section to the Ephesians. And the second affirmation, and another word that I'd like for us to explore, is the word redeemed, redemption. That for us, through the work and word of Jesus Christ, we are brought back into communion, into a relationship with God. This act, this sacrifice, gave us redemption. And the primary purpose of redemption is for forgiveness. So you can't be forgiven, you can't feel forgiven, you can't know what it means to be forgiven if you aren't in a relationship with the person who is forgiving you. Let's break this down to an example. A friend of yours did something awful to you and then broke off all communication afterwards. You've attempted to contact her, you've written her notes, You've called and left messages, and all you want to do is talk about what happened. Find out her side of the story, and perhaps, being generous, forgive her for what she did. But there's nothing. Years end up going by, and you've had to move on. Silently and in your own way, you've forgiven her, but there is no relationship between the two of you. There is, therefore, no redemption that has brought that relationship back. Does she know that you've forgiven her? Is she still afraid of what you might think of her? How you might treat her after all these years? Well, one day, another person comes along and you befriend this person. In fact, the two of you become best friends. You go to lunch, you learn all about each other's families, your past, and one day, the name of your old friend comes up. And it just so happens that this new person is also friends with her. And quietly, gently, this person brings the two of you back together. That is redemption being brought back together in communion into a relationship with another person. You now have the opportunity to express your forgiveness, and your old friend can know that she is forgiven and that all goes well. That is the purpose of redemption. And although Jesus Christ did this in a much more dramatic way and in a permanent way for all eternity, it is exactly what he did for all of us. He was that new friend that brought two people back together, God and ourselves. And finally, a rather simple word that Paul uses, but becomes much greater in its context as it's used here, is the word plan. Not just any plan, but a divine plan in verse 10. That as a plan in the fullness of time, Paul writes, 
to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, a plan. And this is where the study of another language becomes kind of fun, because the Greek word for plan is oikonomia, oikonomia. And that literally translates to a household management. Plan. A household management. In its noun form, it could also be a household steward. The person who saw to it that the family affairs, affairs were kept in order and that everything functioned smoothly and efficiently. Christ literally became the plan the household steward, the oikonomia, where Christ worked out God's policy or the project for the household. That in the fullness of time, God had a goal, a plan for his household, that all history has been in preparation, preparation for that goal. And the goal was that the whole world would be brought together as one family, under one steward, efficiently doing everything smoothly, correctly for the household, chosen for a purpose, redeemed and brought back into communion, just like the prodigal son, and forgiven of all that separated us from the beginning. You know, terrible things can happen in the world. Horrible things can work to separate us as a family. But God's love, as written by Paul in this section, and Christ's redemption should call us to act out our purpose in the world. We are called to live a holy and blameless life, to give and to share, to do all things that the world thinks are completely ridiculous, to be distinct and different, to strive for something more. All because we've been chosen. Not just left over, but picked and chosen by God to spread that same love, acceptance, and blessing to others as one family under heaven. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are continuing to have our offerings collected in, um, in the vestibule before you come in or before you leave today. But let us concentrate our hearts and minds on the blessings that God has given us.
stand in front of our thoughts. Bring God's peace to all you meet today and always.